Hello, lab experts. In today's episode, we sit down with Sori Bangura, a microbiologist from Sierra Leone, who's going to talk to us about microbiology in his country, his perspectives on what it might look like in the future, and also what he works on today. Without much further ado, let's talk MedLab. Our experts, once again, welcome to the Rock Diagnostics Podcast. Hello, Sorry, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm, I'm fine. So you're a microbiologist. How many years have you worked in this field? Two years, I would say. Two okay. years. And what made you want to work in the field in microbiology? First, I did diploma in medical laboratory sciences. Mm -hmm. Then afterwards, I had to do my, my BSc in medical laboratory sciences. And during my study in, in the university, I, I grew more interest in the aspect of microbiology because um, we had lecturers whom we are very much motivating and encouraging. And I saw the, the world of bacteria as something very interesting. And for a region like Sierra Leone, we I came to learn that we have a lot of problems in, in, in infectious diseases that has to do with parasites and bacteria, especially when we have a lot of slump areas, um, a huge number of the population is less privileged to pure drinking water, good food, the rate of poverty is very high. So in, in such communities, we saw a lot of um, hazard happening to, to, to the locals. And when they come into the hospital, yeah. it's pathetic to, to, to a point as a medical staff, when you see such patients, you keep on diagnosing, you see a lot of worms and you see um, a lot of this bacteria and how they are actually handling or manhandling the patient. So it gives me more curiosity to, to learn more about these things. It is one of the reasons that um, thrilled me so much to look into the area of bacteriology and parasitology. Yeah. And as you were studying, was it very, was it a simple, let's say, specialty to get in? So what I mean is, did you have access to internships before you actually were introduced to the laboratory as a worker? Yes, uh, course is being structured in such a way. In the final year of our academic of our academic studies, we would go on internships, um, touring to various laboratories in the country, both in the city and as well as the rural areas. So yes, mm -hmm. we are previewed to internships within the country. Um, after graduation, we were absorbed into the Ministry of Health and Sanitation to work as healthcare workers. It's interesting what you're saying that you were put both in urban and rural areas. So when, depending, I guess it depends on the country. So for example, there are some countries where it's harder to get internships, but I think the way they did it in your case is actually very interesting because they put you in areas where you have access to different kinds of equipment, maybe more modern equipment in the urban areas, and then maybe more of the man manual stuff in the rural areas. How, what was the difference between those two environments? Exactly. Um, there's a huge, but a kind of huge differences in the urban and rural areas. Um, as for the urban areas, we, we, we learn with a, a lot of equipment, more of sophisticated, techniques and the likes. And when we go to the rural areas, there you have to do with the, man, the manual settings. And in our setting, in many of those rural areas, we, we have a kind of setting pathogen or a kind of disease that are kind of localized in those regions. So we are sent to those regions to, to have a feel or hands-on. Um, like, for example, in the southern part of the country, there's a lot of mining going on there. And in, in those areas, 
so we were sent to 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 do our internship in those areas in order to to be able to look at a good number of parasites example like this schistosomas where they have been found to, to to be having a high prevalence of schistosomas so it was easier for us to be able to isolate or to 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 look out for each of the schistosomas whether I'm a mansonai or hematobium it's easier for us to see them there than mm -hmm. in the urban areas so this is one of the reasons we are sent to the rural areas as well yeah and so in the urban areas there were more infections such as schistosoma and mm -hmm. in the urban areas were there any diseases that you found that were not as prevalent in the rural areas or was it always the case that there was always less yes uh, yes exactly in the urban areas we have mostly we've seen mostly of um, helminth such as um the tenias tenia mm -hmm. the species of tenias the genata and that of solium and the hookworm especially the ankylostoma uh, it's prevalent in the urban areas the reason being that um in the urban area some setting in some part of the urban areas there is a a huge kind of um, livestock, or say cow or cattle and sheep, etc., etc., going on, pigs, etc., etc., which you may hardly found in the rural areas. Now, in the case of the schistosoma that you saw when you were in the rural areas and that people suffered from, is it so it's endemic? So it's, it's essentially. Schistosomiasis was endemic to the areas where you were put. Yes, yes. Now, yeah. what are some ways that you... It's endemic. Yeah, so what, what are some ways that you are able to help out when you were there? Like speaking to the people, do they understand how the lab is able to help them or do they sometimes feel as if it's a bit of a burden? So let me explain what I mean. Um, in some cases, you have some patients that feel yes. like when the doctor tells them to go and do the testing, they don't really want to pay for the testing. Because I'm assuming okay. that there, I'm, I'm going to assume, I, I don't know, but that in Sierra Leone, it's a bit like in Benin, where when you go to a medical doctor and he sends mm -hmm. you to the lab, you are the one who has to pay out of pocket for your testing. So yeah. are there some patients who, let's say, in a sense, feel like it's a waste of money and try to go for more traditional remedies? Or do you have a situation there where people are more likely to freely go to the lab for testing? Yes, um, it's a very interesting question. Uh, as you rightly say, it, it's something we experienced, actually. However, in our setting, um, most people in the rural areas, especially in the suburbs, they even have problems of not just going to the laboratory, but of going to the clinic or the hospitals themselves. Okay. okay. Um, yes, yes, yes. Previously, before now, uh, I would say like 10 years back, when such um, situations normally arise, um, like one of the localities which we found to be very much endemic with schistosomas. We, the, um, you see children um, urinating, blood urine, and both male and female. And in, in that region, there was a kind of large scale of farming, uh, sorry, fishing going on. And so, so they used to say, ah, this, this thing is not an ordinary thing. You know, it, it, it's, it's abnormal for a kid to be urinating blood or to be having bloody urine. And so for them, they were associating these things to um, native, okay? Yeah. They are saying these are not medical conditions. These are these are native so conditions, so let's be doing, uh, yes, exactly. So they, they initially had problems even going to the clinics, okay? But when um, things were being put in place and 
a lot of sensitization starts going on and people start realizing, oh, these things that we are associating uh, with native stuff, they, they can really be, they are actually treatable. So it, you find uh, as of now, there are some patients, a good number of patients, when they come into the hospital, they are very much eager to find the laboratory. They don't mm -hmm. care how much probably it would cost us. They don't care how much probably it will cost them. However, we still have a little amount of percentage that will come into the lab and when once they, they are being referred and they will say, oh, me, I do not have money, so let them just go and give me. So it, But now it has been um, set up in such a way that the, the, the clinicians, the CHOs, um, would not treat a patient without a laboratory confirmation. So yeah. in either way, it enhances the, the patient to find a way and do their labs, get the results, refer back to the CHOs or the clinicians in order for them to be treated. So yeah. So that means they're actually, so for you to get to that stage, that means there has actually been a lot of sensitization going on in the background. I yes. know this doesn't have to do directly with your work in the laboratory, but just in case you have an idea, do you have any, mm. can you uh, tell us how the sensitization was done? Like, do you have any idea? Like, did it involve sending people to the villages directly to talk to people or how did it go? Do you know? Yes. Um, the lab wasn't involved directly in such sensitization. In our cases, there are public health officers, um, there are nurses, and sometimes clinicians and even CHOs, yes. Um, the Ministry of Health and Sanitation has some teams set up and sent to the people in the provinces because uh, we have a clue of what of what the sketch was and what was the plan of doing the mass sensitization to people of the essence going to be uh, the essence of going to the clinics and get their uh, um, laboratory being done in order for them to have a better and proper management. So there are there are banners, there are signages, there are um, um, cards, you know, that because some people in those years, they can read and they can write. So um, what will benefit them is a lot of illustrations and signages, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so yeah. that was some of the methods I could remember was was employed to, to do the sensitizations. Yeah. So moving away from the public health and back into the lab, which is where yes. we usually are. When yes, you're in exactly. those rural areas and you had to deal with patients that had these infections, I'm assuming in those cases, you would be able to do it directly there, right? It's, all you did was the microscope and uh, the slides, some reagents, and you're able to do some, mm. how do I put it, the testing on the ground. I did, was Were there any cases where you needed special equipment where, for example, you had to transfer or send laboratories for confirmation to other labs or you always were able to do it at your level? Um, yes. For many times, um, test that has to do with um, just your analysis and stool analysis, yes, the, the facilities has um, that minimum capacity to diagnose of, of what is being requested for in those facilities. There are real cases, um, for example, like for the TB programs and the malaria programs. So it's been set up, the, 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 the suburb areas, which a little bit of diagnosis is being done and weekly, sorry, monthly, or uh, yes, monthly, a number of those positives and negative slides have been sent to the, there's a regional laboratory that does confirmation or confirmatory to, to, to those tests that have been done in those sort of regions. Yeah, but many times, um, most of um, that local or common basic test uh, that has to do with the analysis or stool analysis, there are usually microscopes, and the interesting thing about the microscopes, one of the, the, the good thing of us going to the, to the regions, uh, the, the light efficiency, you know, in, in the urban areas, there is, there is so much light. So we were used to that. But when you go to the regions, you're being forced to manipulate <laughs> in a situation where there is no light. 
we have to we had to use mirrors okay and look for reflection <laughs> yeah yes i look for reflections a uh, uh, good light is in order for you to be able to focus what is whatever is on that yeah. slide so that's a, a good indigenous technique yeah because i <laughs> i remember back in high school using those uh microscopes with the actual mirrors and then you you turn it towards yes. the sun and then you flip the mirror so yes. just at the right <laughs> angle so that you can actually yes, get the light exactly and see what, exactly what you do yeah i think yes. in our countries we well we have to right we at the end of the day it's people's lives that are at stake so we have to do whatever we can in order to be able to actually deliver the services even if yes. it's in conditions that are not necessarily the best we need to in our in our in our case at least do our best to actually give out some of those results. But as you mean, did you also have access to like maybe solar or maybe like um, generators or not? Because what happened if it was a, if it, let's say there was an urgent case at night, what would be the procedure to follow? Yeah, actually, um, there are solars. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are solars, and um, in some facilities there are generators. So yes, and, and those generators usually serve for the rest of the night, and even those solars can serve like some days. And yes, they are able to serve the the, the facilities. All right. So that part works. Now going a bit back to the university setting. How was it studying for medical laboratories, science in your country? Was it a simple experience? Was it a bit more complex? What was it like? Or let me change that a bit. Yeah. What you studied in university, is it very similar or were there lots of differences compared to what you had to do when you actually got there in, in the field? In the field. Um, I, I think I would say it, it, there wasn't any difference, uh, really. Um, we did the BSc program, so which means it has to do with some advanced parts of what we earlier did in our diploma. So yes, a, a, a good number of what we made in the working facilities and the working areas are things that we have been already previewed um, uh, during our course career in the university. So it was easier for us to adapt. The interesting thing about our part was um, we were the first batch of biomedical scientists in the country. So it wasn't far enough when we actually started the BSc program in Sierra Leone. And it's just been two years, okay, I would say since, since we graduated. So the, the ministry did all what it could to ensure that we have the necessary capacity in order for us to work in the actual capacity of what it means to be a biomedical scientist. So yeah, though there were a little bit of um, challenges because um, we had a huge or high expectation. Um, what, what I'm actually saying is like, for example, you, 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 you you will have a BSc holder coming into a facility and probably just be doing um, RDTs, RDTs all the time, which yes, which may, which may seem like, uh, how can I be doing? So the person needs to be doing some things um, as per standard, like that of the molecular level and moving things to such a high level and see how those people will actually enhance or give their they are right support to the clinical setting or to patient management and to the health system in the country as well. But in overall, things are getting um, good and smooth. So yeah, it wasn't difficult for us to adapt in our working in our working environment. Yeah, so it's okay. Okay, that's good to know. Now, still talking about the difference, like switching from the let's say studying to the actual work. How did you deal with the, I'm assuming, I don't know, different people is different, but how did you deal with the stress if there was any? 
of being in a lab because when you come to the lab, it's different, right? It's in some cases, there are urgencies. So there are cases in which you have to be there. Maybe you are doing something else. Something happened to one person. He's not able to come for a shift. Maybe you have to come over and then help out or you're supposed to spend the night over there. Or in some cases, if it's really bad, you never know. You could spend 48, 72 hours right there just doing the work. How do you deal with those sorts of situations? Interesting, uh, a very interesting question. Um, I, I could remember very well, because um, we work, I work in a facility, like I said, it's a referral hospital. So there is always inflow of patients, which is huge. And when we had the, 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 the fire accident, actually, that day was overwhelming and yes, we, I, I was at my home, it was at about seven to eight. And after prayer, I was hoping, okay, let me come and do a little bit of studying and do some things and then go to bed. Just as I was about to rest and then there was a call say, hey man, there's an emergency. That's always the case. <laughs> and yes, exactly. And where I was staying to the hospital is kind of little night and move all the way to corners. I was. I was dizzy, I was sleepy. But when I reached the site, oh, I, I was all awoken because it's over when there were patients, health or skelter. They were requesting for, you have to do be doing electrolytes. Please do some swabbing and see you have. We want to do some isolation. You have doctors panting into your lab and they, they were like every time requesting for, 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 for results. So yes, th those situations, they normally come and they do come. Mm -hmm. As a professional, I have been actually able to handle such situations amicably, and we had some good moments in there. All right. Yeah, I think in those situations also, it's very important to have good relationships with not just the people you are working with, so not just the scientists, but also like the doctors and also the nurses. I think that's something that sometimes we forget when we are in the lab because we are there with our microscopes. But we don't always necessarily think about how to create better relationships with those people because in times like that, it becomes very important because it's different if let's say you're talking to someone that you have, like you're used to conversing with where they see you as a human being as opposed to someone that maybe you're not used to talking to. And then when the samples don't come out fast, they feel like you are trying to undermine them in some cases. So it's always weird because when they come, it's almost as if you are the one trying to hold the results when it's not in your interest to hold the results, like you want the results to actually go out. So I think that's one thing we could probably try and work a bit more on generally as scientists, creating those relationships in advance. So when the problems actually show up, at least it's simpler to deal with them. Now, let's see, I wanted to talk about something. That yeah, I... Yes, exactly. Um, I, I... Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yes, I, I think you, you, you're right of what, what you just said is very important. And it's something that me personally, I have been working with because back then in the university, um, a good number of them, we were just like colleagues. We, we do have some models. We were actually matched. While it's been, I could remember uh, by chemistry, we had to sit with the medical students. So okay. there was this kind of interaction. It's a kind of, yes, the, there was a kind of, um, a little kind of bad mentality in so many laboratories of not establishing is a kind of conflict between the clinicians and the, the, lab, the labs. Being that um, the, lab, the lab personnel are seeing these clinicians, they, they do not uh, actually value of what we're doing. I look at them, they're looking at themselves so superior to, to, to us, so I'm not going to even talk to him. So, yeah, but for me, it's something that I have been working with because, and I have been having very good results in such relationship, just as you said. There was another day when a clinician came into our facility. He was stressing and panting about a, a patient that he has been managing and the result has been delayed. He was shouting and the staff that were present at that, at that moment could not contain him. So 
fortunately, I came along, and as a result of the relationship we already had, yeah. it, it, the continents of the clinician already changed, and yeah. it was like, okay, I've seen someone that that is probably good, good, good looking, and probably says something. Then I'll listen. So please say something. My result has been stuck here. Can you please do something for me? And I was able to calm him down, and he he understood actually. Because it wasn't the fault of the laboratory by then. We had mm -hmm. a power shot down. What happened? So we had a power shot down and the, the machines went down. So we couldn't get them on in time to analyze the samples and make the results available. So mm -hmm. yes, they, you have you have a very good point there. And it, I think it's something we also have to be working on. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Now, speaking about this particular point, there's one thing I, I want to get your opinion on. It's yes. uh, because particularly in microbiology is extremely important. The, um, how do I put it, forgetting the word, but the quality of samples uh, and yes. the samples you're getting in the lab for bacteriology, parasitology is extremely important for the sampling to be done in correct conditions. Now, I think the difference is that uh, I was thinking about it more as far as relationship with other healthcare professionals, but I think the difference is in, para, in bacteriology, parasitology, the sampling yes. may be done by patients also. So maybe it's more, in this case, it's more of your relationship with the patient and how you're able to communicate with them. But usually yes. how do you manage that aspect of communication with the patients to ensure that the samples you obtain are actually brought the way that you yes. need them. And if they are not brought the way that you need them, do you directly tell the patient to redo it or do you go through the nurses? How do you usually go about that? Okay, it, um, many times patients um, are sent to the laboratory to do their test, especially those patients that are strong and are mobile. Yeah. There are some patients that are normally in the wards, they've been admitted. Some are mostly in critical conditions and they can't move. So for those patients that come into the laboratory, for example, if a case of UTI is being sus sus suspected or ask the patient, okay, take their time and explain to the to the patient, say, okay, bring such, such um, urine sample. Uh, when they come, they'll tell you, um, I, I can't I can't pass enough urine. For me, this one is okay. Maybe the volume of urine will be so small, even a this even a deep stick, <laughs> even a deep stick can go there. So in such cases, we do normally if the patient comes directly, we had an interface with the patient. We 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 would go to the patient again and and educate them as to why it is important for us to have the required or the necessary sample we actually needed. So you have some patients that are very understanding and they, they will cooperate with you very well and they will decide to, to go back, they will mind, they will decide to go back and then pass again the sample and then bring this sample on the right one. If it's a patient in the world, we have to go through the, the nurses because many times nurses are in care of such patients and will ask the nurses and give them direction and monitor the patient's mobility and, and, and phases and have us collect or get, have us get the sample. And the sooner they have the sample, it's that they send the sample to the lab or they call the attention of the lab, would come into the awards and then get the samples and for analysis. So this clean normally, this is what we do. So now leaving this aspect, the pre-analytic side and going to, let's say, the more post-analytic. Uh, yes. One thing that I think we might be missing in some of our African countries is, as far as bacteriology, parasitology, let's say microbiology in general is concerned, is um, mm -hmm. our quality control and the quality assurance aspect. It's not always what we would like it to be. Sometimes maybe because of uh, budgetary constraints, sometimes because I mean, for a variety of reasons. In your case, how do you usually go about that aspect? Let's say someone is watching that may, that may want to get an idea of how they could improve their services in their own lab. What do you usually try and do for to improve to improve that aspect of things, the quality control part? Yes. Um, 
in our setting, we have the, the clinicians to interface with the nurses, the CHOs, the patients, and yeah, it, these are the two main facets we mostly deal with. And one of the ways we actually use so to know what we are doing or to ensure our quality is actually on track. We actually normally do get a questionnaire, a kind of customer survey, um, customer survey, survey um, souvenir or questionnaire, which we do give the clinicians to have their open-minded um, opinions and suggestions as to what lab has done so far that suits them or satisfy them. The we we start at the turnaround time. Um, is the time the time of releasing results? Are they okay? Are they satisfied by the by the clinicians? Um, do they receive their their results on time? And what 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 has been the impact so far of them receiving the results on time, or maybe late? And uh, what would they have the laboratory do to improve if, per se, the quality of results? Is the results actually um, of quality is the results giving them what they are needing. For example, they are, they are, they are suspecting a kind of pathogen to be causing certain um, disease, maybe UTI. Are, are, they, are we giving them the isolates? Is the, is the laboratory being in coincidence of what they are suspecting clinically? I would have them um, give an opinion to, to, to help us improve the services we give to, have to, to, to them. We mm. also have another survey for, for the patients when they come into the facility and then we ask them questions to, to help us understand the service the laboratory is providing for them. Are they satisfied? Are they being treated well? Are they being received well? Are they being attended to on time? Do they receive the results on time? How is the laboratory um, price list, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the ways we actually uh, employ in order to help us monitor the outputs or how efficient our out uh, the laboratory output is in terms of and quality assurance. How, how often do you give these uh, questionnaires to the physicians? Is it like a yearly thing? So we do that, um, can I say, every six months. And so that has been working. There haven't been issues with people not really replying. I'm guessing they are not that long, right? Maybe like one page, two pages, or yeah, yes, yes. It's it's a one page thing. It's a one page thing. Now, are there physicians that ever complain about, or do you see in your laboratory cases of antimicrobial resistance? Um, yes, we have few. We have few actually, not, not many times. But yeah, we, there are cases of antimicrobial resistance that we don't normally have. Mm. Now, mm -hmm. whenever that happens, what is your, what's the procedure you follow? Let's say you, a case comes and then you find that it's resistant to, I don't know if you've ever had a case where it's resistant to everything you have in the lab. But if you get something of that nature, what's the next step? What do you usually do? So um, we haven't had cases um, in which all the antibiogram are resistance to a particular pathogen. But um, there is a, a, an SOP that tells us when once we have, perhaps we have such cases, um, there is the reference laboratory in which all samples are being sent for further, yes, for further analysis, maybe using the PCR or whatever it is. It hasn't been working efficiently for us uh, mm -hmm. of recently. So we still have challenges in, in rectifying those cases. Thank God we haven't we haven't this in which all the antibiograms are being in existence. Now, what are some of the problems you have with uh, sending the samples over to the reference lab? Yes, um, one of the challenges is the machines and the analyzers, okay, the agents that, and the, the, the structure has been set up actually. Really. Okay. So 
So many times diagnoses are just based on and left on the facility level. Referring them to the reference laboratory is very difficult for them. So okay, because there hasn't been that capacity that set up, yes. Mm. Now, apart from what we have discussed, is there anything you'd like, anything specifically you'd like, like to talk about? Um, yes. Um, one of the things that I have been thinking about, because, um, you know, in Africa, we are living, mm -hmm. yes, a, a good number of the regions are less privileged to advanced diagnostic systems and probably not just advanced diagnostic systems, even staffs, capacity, the university and the likes. So I was thinking, um, is there a way we, we could come together as, 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 as Africans to see, to put things in place on how we would extend a helping hand to search facilities like for example in our case as we're seeing right now um if we do have such cases of anti 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 gum resistance we we'll probably do not have anywhere to refer such cases so if there would be a kind of link or in a uh, um, kind of networking between yeah. laboratories in in africa staff and bring uh, bring bring us all together at one page in which we would find a ways looking at how the strength of some facilities and their weaknesses. And maybe mm -hmm. me having search and I'll say, okay, I could help you search. Mm -hmm. uh, I would help with search. Yeah. So I was thinking, yes, yes. So this is these are some of the things that I'm thinking about. And yeah. SLM as a body I know has been doing very well. Mm -hmm. And and I'm hoping they would see how best they would do to to help Sierra Leone us especially because in our system we haven't haven't even been able to have a licensure system yeah, yeah actually that's a very interesting idea so essentially creating a body that would include labs from various areas various countries that will be able to share some of their knowledge together. Yeah, that's something we should do. Now, but when it comes to samples, I think moving from individual countries, I think have those sorts of partnerships with countries that are around them. So for example, I know that in Benin here, there are some cases, I mean, in some situations where there are cases when it comes to, let's say Lassa fever, mm. as an example, Yeah. when they get the samples, they can actually send the samples over to some reference laboratories in Nigeria for the testing to be done and they can get the results. So it also helps them uh, confirm the results that they obtain. So actually in your country, I don't know, maybe you could try and get in contact with people from the um, Ministry of Health to see if there aren't any such programs already. Because I think for okay. at this sort of level, one of the things that has to happen first. Yes, eventually we need to come yes. together as uh, come together in order to uh, create uh, a small, let's say, organized way of discussing with everybody. But actually, I think if you go through your ministry, they may already yes. have some contacts with countries, neighboring countries around you, yes. that they can send some of those cases to. So when yeah. it comes to a situation where it's really yes, important, yes. they can actually coordinate yes. those. Yeah. Now, the only difference is that in most cases, they will tend to activate those networks only when the danger reaches, reaches a certain threshold. So when you get to, a, let's say, the level of uh, an endemic problem or an epidemic that starts yeah. spreading, that's when those networks really kick in. But okay. maybe what we need to do is find ways of making it so that it's easier, even at like lower thresholds, to be able to send samples so that um, they can be confirmed in other places. But I think the okay. big problem would be the costs of having to send it to a whole different country because you know sometimes already within our own countries, 
can be hard yeah. to say you'll take one sample and then send it to another area of the country. Yeah. So sending it to different countries requires a lot of planning, lots of people sitting down and then thinking of the networks and then how to move things around, thinking of the supply chain, the cold yeah. chain, making sure that the samples, when they are sent, they are kept in the correct conditions. So for example, we've had issues with yes. things like vaccines where yes, they've not always been kept in the best conditions. And so mm -hmm. it's something that yes, we should definitely do. I think people are thinking about that, but in some cases it's uh, just the planning that takes a lot of, uh, a lot of resources because at our levels, I wonder if we can do a lot about that. That's what I'm thinking. We'll probably have to go through, but what I think can be done is through our different associations. So if, for example, the medical association in Benin here starts discussing with the medical association with Sierra Leone, and then a yes. couple others come together, then that is yes. something that already is going to start creating some sort of synergy. Exactly. That eventually is going to lead to what you're talking about. Exactly, exactly. That, that was actually what I was going to say a <laughs> okay. minute later. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So we would be very much happy if um, a kind of thing like that is 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 being set up because we are actually also working on um, uh, our own association in the country. So there's a kind of thing in which um, these associations would come together, be having communications like summits, seminars, conferences, and the likes as young practitioners to see how this would help the continent in improving diagnostic system, especially for the young generation that come in and see what we want ahead with our diagnostic system in, in, in the region. I think it would be a very good thing. Yeah, it would be something we should start thinking about and then seeing how, seeing how it could actually be done. Yeah. Exactly. So oh, sorry. Thanks a lot for taking the time to speak with us today. Hopefully, we are going to have pleasure. you again on here very soon to talk a little bit more about the situation of medical laboratory science in your country and where you actually see it going, like in the next few years. So, we'll be very happy to have you again. Okay. No problem. Thank you very much. It will be a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. See you next time.